uh, please feel free to take photographs. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Kaz Macklin from Kent Invicta Chamber of Commerce. I'm supported here today by Team Chamber in the shape of Adam, Adam Taylor from Kent Invicta Chamber. Our keynote speakers today are Mark Lumsden and David Hall from McIntyre Hudson. Gentlemen, good morning to you both. Thank you so much for joining us. Really, really interested to see how this webinar is going to pan forward. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if I could kindly ask you to mute um, just for background noise, we will be having a chat facility. So do post questions in there. And David and Mark, would it be okay periodically to take questions from our guests? Yes, um, I think we're happy to do that. I think we can either do it uh, build up towards the end or we can do it as we go, whatever the best process or you guys have done in the past. So I'm entirely in your hands on that one, Kaz. If you want to do it as we go, we can, or we can do it um, halfway through. Do you know what, Mark? Um, I think it's a lot more interactive if people have a burning question that they have an answer to, and it just makes it a bit interesting. I don't know about you guys, but by the time I've got to the end, sometimes my mojo is a bit depleted and I've lost my train of thought. We've done but it in yeah. both ways. We've done yeah, it yeah. both ways. Yeah, well, cool. Let's do that then. Yeah, if you put your questions in the chat, ladies and gentlemen, what I'll do is I'll field those to Mr. Lumsden and hopefully he'll be able to shed light and uh, illuminate us all on on, on, on the answers in going forward. Gentlemen, without further ado, the, 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 the floor is yours. Welcome and let's get this show on the road. Cool. Well, I thought we will start. Um, I'm going to hand over to David in a moment, just by way of a brief introduction uh, of myself and um, David to introduce himself as well. So uh, my name is Mark James Lumsden Taylor. I am a partner at MHA McIntyre Hudson. Uh, my remit is Kent in the South East, and uh, I also are seconded as a uh, UK finance director, but I'm also the joint UK head of environmental social governance. And I did it in my former life, um, as it was formerly known as corporate and social responsibility back in the day, which Kaz has just alluded to. And um, it's more than a job, it is a passion, and it's something that we absolutely eat, sleep and breathe. And uh, we are delighted to be working with the Chamber on today's event. I think it's very important for business. And it's something that we were thinking where we were doing probably 15 years ago um, in the agricultural sector. So a little bit about me. I also sit on the CBI Southeast Regional Council. Uh, I'm an ambassador for the Institute of Directors and various other posts that I hold nationally. Uh, David. Okay, so uh, my name is David Hall. Um, I've not long ago joined MHA, having run a management consultancy for many years, um, but I've been involved with climate change in particular since the 1980s, um, when there was very little evidence, physical evidence of, of what we're seeing now. Um, I'm currently the director of ESG advisory at McIntyre Hudson. Um, so as we go through, I'll talk to you about not just the, the environmental, but also the social and the governance part of ESG. That's me. OK, so let's uh, let's kick off. Um, I think we'll share, uh, kindly share the screens and we'll. Great. So over to you, David. Next slide, please. OK, so uh, as uh, Kaz has just alluded to, we've we've just gone through a few days of quite extreme temperatures in, in the UK and across Europe and indeed other parts of the world. I think most uh, scientists now agree that uh, high temperatures that we've been seeing are are largely due to climate change uh, and our effect, our impact on the planet. The key thing, I guess, is that it's not only damaging our planet, but it's also making things very difficult for uh, for businesses. And it doesn't matter at what stage you are in a business or what type of business you are, um, climate change is going to affect you if it isn't already affecting you. The UK government has, has pledged to achieve net zero, uh, which means no further carbon emissions by 2050. Um, and what that means is that in order to get to that 2050 point, there, there have to be a number of serious mitigations taking place along that journey. So there are, there are uh, goals for 2030 and also for key points between that period and 2050. I think the, the big heads up is that the government's intention is that every business will be mandated to play their part. Um, even if 
even if uh, you're not a business that uh, that has to do so now, um, you will be having to, you'll be mandated to report carbon, your carbon emissions and so on uh, over the coming years. So I guess the heads up is that um, it's worth getting ahead of the game. It's worth preparing the groundwork now because it'll make it so much easier um, as you as you move forward. Um, being uh, a responsible business uh, isn't just about expenditure. I talk to lots of people and they see ESG as being just something that, that costs them money or could cost them money. That's not true. There are huge benefits from engaging in uh, an ESG program in terms of business efficiency and effectiveness, and those will reflect in the bottom line. Next slide, please. And just to emphasize that point, uh, here's something that, that Mark says, which is corporate sustainability doesn't have to come at the cost of corporate profitability. And that very much is, is behind everything we do at, uh, at MHA. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, I apologize to those people in the room who know all about uh, ESG and sustainability and climate change and net zero, but I'm just gonna run through just so that we're all uh, on the same page. So ESG, ESG is environmental, social and governance. Um, it superseded the, uh, the old CSR, corporate so social re responsibility. And that's largely because CSR became really something that was just um, mentioned in a report and accounts, or you know, it, it might just have a, a paragraph on a website. Um, what it lacked was any form of metric that enabled us to, to measure where we were going and what we were doing in terms of carbon emissions and so on. So it's more ESG is more specific, it's more measurable, it's more accountable, and it's clearer. If you run your ESG program in the right way within a framework, then it will naturally take you to all of the milestones you need to achieve within your business across a period of time uh, to your deadlines. It will also, um, quite frankly, be something that your customers, your suppliers, and your staff and stakeholders will be expecting you to do. Increasingly, as uh, there is more and more publicity around climate change, We've just had COP26. Um, this is headline news. Um, and increasingly, therefore, people start to demand uh, answers to what you're doing as a business in terms of uh, ESG. It's not just about carbon reporting. Um, ESG is also um, about your staff. It's about your governance. So. We always say that um, most people focus on the E, but we try to give em equal emphasis to the S and the G as well. So environmental, social, and governments. Next slide, please. Okay, so what is sustainability? In simple terms, um, it means only using processes, and protocols, and methodologies that, are, that can be maintained because they don't create any damage in their use. In, within environmental science, uh, sustainability is defined as the quality of not being harmful to the environment or depleting natural resources and thereby supporting long-term ecological balance. So I apologize that at the moment we're talking more about the E than the S and the G, but it's important uh, for all the reasons that I've said. So we are aiming for all businesses to be at a point in time where, uh, where they are not adding to the um, to the climate change issues uh, by virtue of the way that they operate. Um, the, I guess the other important thing to say is that um, is that this is a clearly this is a journey, but unless you map it, unless you have a framework to work to, it's very easy to talk about it, but not to uh, to produce any action. And again, just to remind you, taking action in this area doesn't just mean cost to the business. There are huge benefits. There are paybacks. Uh, that you get from doing this. Next slide, please. So what is net zero? So net zero or carbon uh, neutrality is, uh, is a state where there are zero carbon dioxide emissions uh, and other greenhouse gases. 
So that's covered normally under what we call uh, scope one, scope two, and scope three. And that's a measure of the emissions of the business. Um, and even as we get towards uh, scope three, your supply chain. So that's everything uh, from your vehicles uh, through to uh, what powers your business, your computers and IT and so on and so forth. Net zero can be achieved by balancing uh, carbon emissions with removal or by eliminating carbon emissions uh, altogether. Now, in truth, we're going to achieve net zero through a combination of those. Um, I guess one thing to say is that carbon offsetting is, is becoming increasingly frowned upon um, because in more cases than not, it means simply pushing the problem elsewhere. So, um, so we focus on, on achieving net zero through practical actions uh, rather than, than, than deferments. Okay, the UK government has set a net zero target 2050. Um, at MHA, our target is 2030 to be net zero. Um, and, and we are doing exactly in our business uh, what you will need to do in your businesses. Beyond net zero, um, the, the state beyond that is to achieve then uh, climate balancing. So in other words, once you've, you've achieved your net zero state, then you want to maintain that. Now, in, a, in, a, uh, you know, in an ideal world, you want to become um, climate positive. In, in other words, you want to be giving back to the climate rather than taking away. However, for most businesses, climate balancing is, is, is the target that they will aim for. And if they can sustain that, then that is absolutely the right state to, uh, to achieve. Okay, can I hand over to Mark now for the next slide, please? Yeah, thank you, David. So just before I go into sustainability requirements for uh, SMEs, I think it's just worth, worth mentioning that um, David referred to scope one, scope two, and scope three. You will hear lots of language on today's call um, about the role of environmental social governance and carbon emissions. You, you're not expected to learn it all instantly. I've been dealing with this since 2007, long before it was um, relevant or in vogue in the agricultural world. And you'll hear a, another scope called scope four, which is something that's being looked at in the United States. And this is also about SMEs getting ahead of the curve as well. Um, you're looking for competitive advantage as much as doing the right thing. That's what that's what business does. And scope four is about measuring what you are when you've got to your climate balance position and you are effectively net zero is what are you? What is the opportunity cost of not doing good and measuring that as well, going above and beyond that baseline position. So there is, this is evolving all the time. Scope four hasn't come to the UK or Europe yet, but it's certainly a discussion in the uh, in the United States. And the other thing as well, um, just for those of you that may well, who've been on this call that have not been around for quite some time, you'll remember corporate and social responsibility in that we filed a report every year, you might have cleaned a canal, staff might have run a marathon and all of that, and you put it and you might have reported your equality and diversity statement and you put it on a shelf and tick the and tick the box. Andrew Carnegie said that uh, in order to do, to do good, you must do well. In, in a simple sentence, what environmental social governance is about is actually doing well in the right way, not trying to do it and then do good as a tick box exercise. And that is very much one of the foundations and principles of it. But that all said, there are rules and reporting that is now required for uh, businesses. The things that are most relevant to uh, SMEs at the moment is the Energy Savings Opportunities Regulation Scheme known as ESOS for short, um, you fall into scope in that if you have 250 employees, um, uh, an annual turnover of 40 million and a balance sheet in excess of 38 million, it's, it, it's either or. So if you have a turnover of 44 and or a balance sheet of 38 and you have 250 staff, you fall into scope. Big uh, organizations that fall into scope, they're often um, businesses with a very large casual staff workforce or indeed um, events companies, or indeed um, country parks actually fall into this as well. They basically require you to report your uh, electricity and uh, water usage in effect um, in kilowatt hours. There is a de minimis rule as well that um, applies if, um, if you're under that. The one that most businesses fall into now is SECR, Streamline Energy and uh, Carbon Reporting Rules. 
Uh, this requires businesses to report on their emissions, uh, basically all of their uh, energy usage, water, gas, electricity, and what their kilowatt hours are, and effectively what their carbon dioxide uh, levels are as well as part of that. That has to be reported in the financial accounts um, and then reported effectively publicly. Uh, it's a really important point to note on that, that if it's not reported in the members' reports, then effectively um, the auditors are not doing their job, that they haven't spotted it, they haven't identified it, and you are effectively in breach of those regulations and fines do apply. Um, if you are, if you are uh, using less than 40 megawatts uh, a year, you are out of scope, you don't fall into that. And there is also some rules around group reporting. So if you have a large group of companies and they fall below those thresholds, as they don't necessarily have to report, but collectively as a group, you will if you consolidate those numbers. So it's quite a shout out. There's a whole separate piece on that we're not going to go into today, but just gives you um, a headline. The other big one that if you follow the news that in 1st of April 2022, Task Force on Climate Related Disclosures, known as TCFD, which is applicable to listed companies, was, uh, has now been extended beyond listed companies to large entities. So if you have a business of more than 500 employees and 500 million pounds worth of turnover, you fall into Task Force on Climate Related Disclosures. Now that is a much more detailed set of disclosures, which very much focus around governance, risk, environment and people and there is a detailed standard that outlines all of that and it's coming down the track so you can imagine this year april 22 it's been announced for large businesses what do you think is going to happen next it's going to cascade down and it will cascade down and it will cascade down and will become mandatory for all businesses i imagine within a de minimis rule so the trick here is about getting ahead of the curve we have seen a lot of our clients um some of those large ones who aren't in scope now reporting as if they were in scope why? Because when you go to business, people will download your financial statements and they will look to see how you perform. It is a competitive advantage. We know in business there are two things, although I say there are three now. Who's doing it and how much? My view is who's doing it, how much, and is it being done in the right way? A lot of businesses don't deal with the third point, but the first two are absolutely critical. Next slide, please. So you've basically had a whirlwind of what is going on in the in our world in the environmental social governance world. And with my other hat on when I was an ambassador, when I'm ambassador for Kent, um, environment was seldom ever talked about because we were always looking at business and charities and uh, the impact on the county from, a, from that perspective. But now the environmental impact on the county as well as the UK is as important. So for businesses, first thing you need to do, absolutely first thing to do, get your carbon footprint measured. And if you're an agricultural, business or a supplier and producer, there may be other uh, there may be other emissions such as nitrous oxide, methane, uh, which also need to be measured. It's not just about carbon capture. Carbon is obviously the, is, is the biggest one. Um, and that effectively covers you in your uh, scope one and scope two. And as David said, scope one is effectively everything that um, you produce as a business. And then scope two is everything that you effectively bring in. Scope three, is all of the ancillary emissions. For example, if your staff have cars and they drive to work, how is that measured? If your suppliers bring in used um, energy from Russia, for example, how is that brought in and what is the carbon cost of that? Scope three is currently a really big minefield and there is no set guidance on that where everybody's plowing through and learning this as they go. David talked about planning. Um, you, can measure, you can measure your emissions and that's absolutely fine. But also you then need to look at, well, am I going to do it as a tick box exercise or am I actually going to look at a green investment strategy? But look at what the return on investment is. You don't have to just expend heaps of money to then not get a return. We, a lot of the work we do is look at value return. So when you're investing in environmental social governance, you also need to look at what the return on investment is and how long that return will be. And it is not just about greening your business. There is the social and the governance perspective as well from people, trust, health, corporate behavior, right the way through to ethics and doing things in the right way and reporting in the correct way. Um, low hanging fruit. I've just outlined a couple of points there for um, businesses to think about. You'll be a supplier, no doubt. Most businesses will supply other businesses. Two points there. What is your supply chain doing? Have you given any directives about what, who, what the sort of supplies you want to be supplying you? But also as well, if you're doing 
environmental social governance or not, and yet say you're supplying to supermarkets or supplying to um, very large construction businesses, they'll have requirements because they'll be listed or fall into large business scope. Therefore, they'll be looking to their supply chain to go, well, what are you doing? What can you do to help me with my reporting and my emissions? And if there are two, two suppliers, supplier A supplying 1,000 tonnes of cement, supplier B is supplying 1,000 tonnes of cement, but supplier A has got an ESG strategy in place and is measuring all their emissions and carbon reporting and is doing and has an a S and a G process and the other one doesn't, same price. Which one do you think they're going to go with today? And that's a really important thing for you guys to go away and think about. Also work with the people that know what they're talking about. There are a lot of very good advisors out there who know um, the big four and the top 10 accountancy global firms have been working on this for well over a decade. Um, we are seen as one of the leaders in our mid cap because we're the ninth largest global accountancy firm in the world as MHA McIntyre Hudson, um, which a lot of people don't know. So Kent has the only global firm in uh, the U or in the world in its county based in Maidstone, as well as the Southeast Corridor. But there are others that do know what they are doing. And I would strongly advise to talk to the right people but don't just do a scattergun approach, take inc incremental steps and do it one step at a time in a logical plan, as David said. Otherwise, you're gonna set yourself up to fail and it's gonna cost you a lot more money. David, back to you. Thank you. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? Okay, um, just before I, I go through this, just picking up on a couple of things that Mark uh, has said, the, uh, one of the big advantages of, of uh, having an ESG program is that it also helps you to look at risk within your business. And that is fundamentally important to, uh, to creating a same sustainable business in any event. So, so a good ESG program will be looking at your risk, how you can mitigate risk and how that contrib contributes to your uh, sustainability. I think the other thing to just mention is that Mark uh, talked about the experts in the market um, equally, uh, as whenever there is uh, a, a kind of a new area to look at, there are a number of companies out there that probably won't be as helpful as you, uh, you think they might be. So uh, I just caution you to, uh, to do your homework and, uh, and to look at companies very closely before you engage with them. Um, there are a lot of people out there who are just um, really leveraging this as an opportunity. Um, now, if I can just talk about some of the, uh, the top steps that you can think about when you're uh, putting together your ESG program. The first and most important thing uh, is to encourage uh, discussion at the top level uh, of your business. So whether that's the board or the senior management team. I think Arnie, Arnie Weinstock, uh, the industrialist, once said that the most important thing about forward planning is making sure you're there when it happens. And that absolutely means engaging at board level. It, there's, no, there's no point in pushing it down the chain uh, to begin with because it won't carry the weight that it needs to within your organization. But then beyond that, it's about getting the right people involved. It's not just about getting uh, people involved that, uh, within your business that are keen on the environment or keen on uh, social or governance. Um, it's also about making sure that you have the people with the right knowledge in the right place within your organization and externally. Um, your ESG program, your framework can be very straightforward and can be uh, very smooth to run, but it depends on get, getting engagement with the right people early on. Um, the, the next thing is to just look at what you're already saying about your business. Um, are you saying enough? What's missing? What are you saying? Um, that your competitors are not saying? What are they saying that you're not saying? It's important to start looking at this. Mark uh, is absolutely right when he says uh, that some major corporates now are making purchase decisions and supplier decisions based on ESG and uh, sustainability. Um, we do a lot of work with the major supermarkets, for example, and it's part of their requirement to conform to scope three and increasingly to scope four. So they are going to be looking to you. Um, absolutely set out a plan. This is not something that you can kind of uh, do from day to day. This is about having an end game to have a plan and then milestones along the route to achieve that plan. Um, we, 
we put together, we have our, our own particular approach to ESG is called dynamic ESG, and it, it offers a framework within which everybody knows what they're doing, where they're going, and how they're going to get there. Um, avoid uh, boilerplate disclosures. This is not about generics. This is about what you do in your organization to meet your ESG requirements and sustainability requirements. Um, stay strategic stay on on point and also material this is about practical actions um, and every organization can do things uh, we've yet to go into an organization uh, where we can't find other things that can be done that contribute to sustainability but also benefit the business um, and as mark said talk to the specialists uh, you know there are uh, a number of uh, of um, organizations out there now that are specialized some of which are um, are third third sector organisations, so they're not for profits, um, but certainly talk to the experts um, because there is a lot of detail. When Mark talked about scope four, I mean that that really is highly complex. We suspect scope three is highly uh, complex. So um, so you 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 should really talk to uh, specialists, and, and also listen to the thought leadership. If you if you go online there are increasing amounts of thought leadership around this subject. Um, we certainly produce a lot of thought leadership and, uh, and we just would um, suggest that you, look, that you look at that and start to really get to grips with what's needed. Um, also look at your peers. Um, what are they doing? Um, and uh, what are you doing uh, that, that they're doing or not doing? Um, and don't be afraid to talk to them. Um, we're finding that because of sustainability, because of the, the fact that this is all relatively new to most people. I mean, I've been involved in it since the 80s, but it's only in the last um, five to seven years that things have really increased in pace. Um, so that we, we are seeing a lot more sharing of knowledge amongst um, what would have traditionally been um, competitor organisations. OK, next slide, please. Over to you, Mark. Thanks, David. I would also say as well, um, some of you may be old enough to remember the Y2K bug. Remember all that? Do you remember that whole consultancy world that appeared out of nowhere in 1998 to say we can help sort out your computing and your computers may have a bug in them? And millions, and I mean mid tens of millions, was spent on solving a problem that actually didn't really exist. That was a fad and then that went away. I think the important point with this is that this is not a fad and that this will not go away. So I always use the Y2K bug as a, as, a, as, a, as a point to say, because this is could be seen as that, oh, it's a fad and my goodness me, and you know, the, 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 the planet's warming up and you know, then it'll cool down again. This is actually a long-term business change. Corporate business and listed companies were doing ESG in the early 2000s. It was already there. I was auditing businesses that were doing that. CSR was seen as the mainstream corporate and social responsibility, as I've said before. This is a different approach. And depending on the size of your SM, of the SME, it means different things to different people. So what I've just what we've done here is, and I'm not going to take you through every slide, but the slide deck, Kaz, I'm more than happy for this to be shared. It's um, um, afterwards if people want to come and talk to us, is just an idea of what the grand the granular side of what this looks like. So if could just go to the next slide, please. This is the sort of thing that we look at and do um, in terms of what our businesses need to look at. So we need to look at risk. How are you running the company? The actual risk management structure. Do you even talk about environmental risk in your risk management um, framework? Scenario analysis, what if, um, and disclosures. Uh, some of you will be in scope for disclosures, which is legal, if you, and you need to check that with your accountants or your, or, um, or your auditors if you're in scope for audit. Um, equally strategy you don't have to write a complex strategy but what you do need to do is have a plan one of the uh, ladies i think it was steph on the chat said can we do a carbon offsetting anyway as a journey uh, my answer to, be, to that would be no because it's not credible um and unless because the because we left the united uh, the eu um that went well uh we are no longer in the EU trading emission scheme. So we have our own, which is basically an exact copy of it. That went well. So we now have the Woodlands Offset Scheme, which you can buy uh, credits, but it's in its infancy. And again, the credibility of it is not 
is not is, is, is not wonderful. So when people do say, oh yes, well we've offset our emissions, my, my our response is, well, so what? So what? If you if you're pitching to um, uh, let's say if you're pitching to Taylor Wimpy and you're going to be a contracting, yeah, we sorted our we've sorted our ESG, we're we're offsetting everything. Well, they turn around, and say, so what? Well, that's not going to help my uh, environmental social governance report, which um, when I report to shareholders. So my, 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 my advice is no, I don't think it's a way forward. Um, it's, it, everyone has their own views, of course, but that is the view of us. And also from McIntyre Hudson's perspective, um, we, are, we are signed up to the Science-Based Targets Initiative, SBTI. Um, that is the gold standard for uh, target setting, and they do not allow any form of carbon offsetting in their standards. And that's the gold standard. So all the leading companies of the world, uh, Unilever, the Amazons of this world, the Barclays Banks of this world, all are signed up to the SBTIs and there is no carbon offsetting. So it kind of gives you an idea of where it's viewed. So there are different processes. And then obviously um, we are sex specialists. So we work in the agri-food and farming industries. The approach there is very different to what we do in construction, which is very different to do what we do deal with in mining. And as the firm acts for listed companies, it's the fifth largest listed actor outside of the big four. We have got a lot of rules that we need to follow as well with the Financial Reporting Council. Next slide, please. So I'm not gonna again, there's a lot on that slide, I'm not gonna drill into it, other than just to say that when you do set your emissions targets, um, got to make sure that they're realistic, that they can be done over a period of time, and that when you set your targets in scope one and scope two, aim to cover at least 95% of all of your emissions. And even if that takes a long time, over a year or something, you're on that journey. That's far more credible than anything else. Obviously short, medium term, long term goals. Um, and also as well, you need to challenge yourself. David talked about your peers. Set, have your own green group, depending on the size of your company. Bring in the younger people and the younger personnel within the organization who are often more aligned to this than the slightly older generation, although the old generation are getting on board, to actually discuss this and use that knowledge and experience. So again, whether it's 2030, 2040, 2050, that's in your uh, remit. There is a lot of talk now about bringing that year back. So obviously we're 2030, we've got a lot. We've got um, a, a big journey to go on, a tight journey to go on, but others are setting um, 2040, 2050. And it's okay to go in steps. And it's also okay not to necessarily hit the targets that you set, but then just remap them, but make sure you're aiming towards that endpoint. Next slide, please. Some of the things that we've picked up in our travels um, with clients and businesses, um, waste, big piece around everything that businesses do. The volume of fresh water and consumption, you've seen the recent heat wave, water is becoming an increasingly scarce commodity, and that wasn't necessarily featured so highly in emissions work, so obviously it doesn't necessarily produce uh, carbon dioxide, but the recording and usage of water is going to become increasingly into scope. Plastic packaging, um, David, I, con uh, I consider one of the world's experts in plastic packaging taxes, uh, and um, that obviously has a significant impact on what you do. It's taxed, the first reporting quarter happened literally uh, April, May, June, this month, the first reporting period. So quite a bit, few businesses have gone, oh my goodness, we're actually in scope, what do we do? It's part of ESG, look at your consumptions. And again, if you plan it, you won't end up getting taxed, you can reduce that cost, return, value, return on investment. So it's just thinking slightly laterally. And also the, uh, the climate levy, which is the opportunity to reduce your, the levy on your bills, Obviously, the deadlines closed, uh, I think the end of January, I think it was. They're reviewing the scheme. That's going to open again. Put it on your radar. Start thinking. That does apply to small businesses as much as anything else, as well as mid caps. So just to give you a bit of a flavor for that. Next slide, please. These are just snapshots, by the way. Um, just wanted to share with you a short video, um, which gives you an idea of the scale of what MHA have done with our journey, because we're not credible to you unless we're actually doing it ourselves as well. So just ask them to uh, play the video, please. At MHA, we firmly believe that the world in which we live can be sustainable. Every individual and organization has a part to play. Our clients, our staff, our supply chain, and all of our stakeholders. That is why we have developed our internal sustainability approach, 
and a dynamic ESG suite of services. This places equal emphasis on environment, social and governance to deliver a sustainable tomorrow today. MHA's commitment to a global sustainability and dynamic ESG approach is underpinned by their action within the Bayfitting International Network. This enables them to deliver their ESG services in the areas of assurance, advisory and technical through the international scope of a wholly connected and integrated organisation. The MHA approach to sustainability means we walk the walk as well as talk the talk. Client services through Dynamic ESG are unique in their approach to environmental, social and governance matters. Dynamic ESG and its sister Dynamic ESG Lite for SMEs are based upon our core assurance, advisory, reporting and technical services. This gives a commercially sustainable approach to business commitment to deliver their ESG adding real fiscal value and financial positioning. Thank you. Um, I must apologize actually. I, I've often been caught out when I've done a presentation and I'm wearing the same suit and tie as what's in the video, which people think I've only got one suit. Um, and I'm not wearing a suit today because I'm remote, which is the first time I've ever done a webinar without a suit on. So I do apologize, but David's, David's holding the flag high. But that just gives you a flavor and a scope of what we have done as a global business and a global firm um, and how serious we are about this sort of thing. And you must make sure, which leads on to the next couple of points, actually, that this is it's got substance behind it. So just back over to David now to wrap up with a couple of, uh, a couple of final slides. I think it's both of us, actually, David. Yes. yes. Um, so uh, just before I um, go through this slide, uh, just a couple of points. Uh, picking up on Mark's uh, comments about uh, plastic tax, uh, I'm dealing with an organisation at the moment who, uh, which imports pre-packed uh, foods, which it, it, it effectively acts as a, um, a consolidator and then sends out to, um, to uh, retail. Um, and they believed that they were not in scope because uh, clearly the, the packaging was, was being uh, put in place elsewhere, in fact, in, in Europe. The reality is they are in scope um, and, um, and, and therefore have to report um, their plastic usage. Um, so just because you're not actually applying the plastic in your uh, premises doesn't mean to say you're not in scope. So it's just a, a heads up there. The other point I did want to make before going into what to avoid is something that you absolutely should not avoid. And that is, um, you know, when you're when you're putting together your ESG framework, uh, just make sure it's smart. So make sure it's specific, make sure it's measurable, make sure that it's achievable above all else. Um, and make sure that it's um, you know, realistic, actionable, and also time bound. So set deadlines for achieving things, measure them and make sure that you don't miss those deadlines. Let's just then look at, um, at what to avoid. Uh, we've come out of a, a, a period where uh, CSR was, was uh, you know, kind of flavor of the month, but, but had no legs, had no teeth. Um, ESG is very different, but nonetheless, people are still um, trying to, uh, to, to abuse it, if you like. One of the things to avoid is what we term greenwashing. It's a commonly used term now. And what it means is putting um, marketing spin on things um, and using that marketing to persuade the public that, uh, that your organization's products and policies and aims and so on are environmentally friendly when they're not. What we're seeing now increasingly, particularly in the States, but, but even but, uh, more regularly in, the, in Europe and in the UK as well, is organizations taking businesses to court over their, over their marketing spin, over their greenwashing. Um, a number of the airlines have already been taken to court and challenged over um, their advertising. And, and we're gonna see that happening more and more. So greenwashing, absolutely something that uh, you should be avoiding. Mark? Yeah, and, the, and um, the most recent comment on this now is green wishing. So um, those businesses that make a series of pledges, make a series of commitments and statements, uh, and then have absolutely no idea about how they're going to achieve them, and then effectively caught out, whether that's through uh, Financial Reporting Council, um, the SBT, Science-Based Targets Initiative, SBTI, or indeed um, 
auditors per se, and then they are publicly reported on and then they are in serious trouble. And for those large consumer brands where they're not getting it right um, and they're not taking it seriously, um, it damages their reputation and damages their, their value effectively and damages their return to shareholders. So we strongly um, advise people to think differently. And again, it's the social and the governance aspect in this as much as it is the environmental. So yeah, just two key shout outs. You'll hear those terms used increasingly more and more and more, greenwashing and greenwishing. Uh, okay, David. Next slide, please. In the video, uh, I'm sure you heard mention uh, two forms of, of our dynamic ESG. One, which is uh, the full dynamic ESG. The other is uh, dynamic ESG light. Um, light was uh, developed specifically for SMEs and um, and for organizations where you might need a proof of effectiveness uh, before um, the senior management team can commit to a full uh, ESG program. Um, they're designed to, to dovetail. So if you begin a dynamic ESG light program, that feeds naturally into the full program. What light does is it looks at the key metrics. So the vital metrics. Um, it helps you to build your framework, but it doesn't provide you with a framework. The full ESG, the dynamic ESG does, of course. Next slide, please. Um, so the, all of the, um, the, the dynamic ESG offerings that we have um, are based on uh, core print, the same core principles. So everything we do is helping you to get to the target that you need to achieve. The key thing is that once you start your journey in every instance that we've, um, we've put in place uh, dy dynamic ESG light, we've found that organizations then want to, uh, to get serious and to pursue the full uh, ES dynamic ESG program. Um, so light is a way of just convincing the board or the senior management team that you should be doing something. Light is um, a version that can be used to provide, as I say, proof of concept. Um, and light is something that, that kind of kicks you off on your journey, that can get you going. If you're a little bit nervous and you're not quite sure what to do, it provides uh, a pathway for you to follow. Next slide, please. Mark. So to wrap up, um, just to give you a bit of an, an idea, as I said, there are a lot of um, people out there that's, that they think they know about environmental social governance. They do not. Um, they won't have the necessary knowledge and understanding of what the actual process means. And depending on the style and scale, scale of your company, will determine what you need to do. Um, people will look at it as a competitive advantage, rightly so. People will also look at doing the right thing as well. And we think the two things can be combined, i.e. profit with purpose. The firm's approach and what we do is we break environmental social governance down into climate change and, and innovation, which is the E. Social, which is trust. We think trust is absolutely implicit in business. And governance, which is the people, the workforce, and your supply chain, as well as the overarching management of the business. I'm not gonna go into the depth of this slide, but suffice to say that there is a very complex um, reporting compliance structure that has been built over the course of the last, yeah, I suppose 20 years, I suppose, um, that is now coming down the track and cascading to businesses that are gradually, that are getting that are smaller. So at the moment it's large companies that will cascade in a year's time. The government is committed to this, whoever our um, prime minister will be it's going to happen. So our strong advice is to get on the journey or get on the train now, but do it in a logical process. And um, yeah, work forward. I just want to, at this point, um, draw in a couple of questions. And I think, Steph, whilst I answered you in chat, um, Steph Harris, did you want to actually ask the question in, in, in the forum as well, if that's helpful? Yeah, I'd be happy to, if you like. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, as a small business, you know, we've only got 16 staff. We're, we're, we're considering our approach to reaching net zero. And, um, you know, we've seen other companies, pub, you know, publish about, you know, they're now carbon neutral because they're offsetting. I suppose for me, the question was, and I agree with what you're saying about it being one of those things that can like raise an eyebrow by saying it. But I just wondered, is it better for us to do that than nothing whilst we work to get to net zero? Um, because it feels like it could take us a while to get to net zero, if that makes sense. So, 
is there something that we can be doing in the meantime to help reduce or offset um, whilst we work on this journey, if that makes sense? Yeah, I would say money is far better spent on actually changing the nature of your business than spending it on an offsetting cost campaign, if you like. Um, that will get you a much further long-term benefit than mapping out a plan and even just getting those basic structures in place. Um, looking at particular, whether it's waste recycling, the way in which you handle your staff, the way in which you um, promote yourself and publish yourself as well, and kind of getting out some a clear sustainability statement, a clear commitment, a clear promise. Statements and promises are both are two different things. And getting those basic structures in line, Steph, will be far more valuable and far more um, credible than going when we're offsetting. Because offsetting actually doesn't necessarily make a material difference. And um, the, the IPPC, um, International Planet, International Panel on uh, Policy and Climate Reporting, IPCC, has actually said that carbon offsetting doesn't necessarily make a material difference to whether or not we'll be able to stop the rate, the heating of the planet beyond 1.5 degrees. So it's not, it was 10 years ago seen as quite a credible alternative because it was, it was, it was a little bit wild west, if I'm honest, it wasn't very regulated and people were lord, uh, lording it about, um, particularly listed entities, that's been really frowned upon now. So I think more than happy to have a conversation with you afterwards and um, talk about putting in a basic, just a simple basic plan, Steph, and that's been far more credible to your staff. And I don't know what your age profile is in your business, um, but your younger staff, we found this, we have 1,500 people in the UK, 37,000 globally. Um, on average, we recruit 200 new juniors, sort of younger staff. They're interested in action. They're interested in incredible impact on their work environment. Offsetting went down like a cup of cold sick when we talked about it. And we said, what do you think to this? And they just went, we don't believe in it. It's not right. So it, it also helps recruitment. I found that in a couple of the businesses that I CFO at. And um, when you talk about a realistic policy, they go, oh, okay, okay, that's interesting. That's something I want to get involved in. So someone can pick up separate stuff, but it's a really excellent point because there's a really big view on carbon offsetting. That's our, that's our considered view. You could talk to another consultant or sorry, another pe person who might say it's completely the right thing to do. We don't, and our research and the work that we do with government suggests that we are right. Yeah, that's really useful. Thank you, Mark. I think it's just interesting to kind of like the greenwashing, green wishing thing is really big. And, I've, and I have seen a lot of that. And I do like raise an eyebrow when I see people go, oh, we're now carbon neutral because we're offsetting. I suppose we're quite lucky in the fact that we're a little bit further ahead. We've already me measured our baseline. We understand what our scopes are and we're looking to reduce those. So we have got a bit of a framework in place. It's interesting to hear that that feels like a better option than, you know, paying to offset. So thank you for sharing that. No, Steph, no, thank no, you no. very much. Yeah, may I great just, question. Oh, Sorry, David. David. Sorry, may I just add, Steph, that um, you know, just this is a journey. Um, so people appreciate you mapping that journey and, and talking to them about that journey. And that's where you'll get your credibility from. Yeah. David, thank you. Mark, we have a question from uh, JD. JD, if I could kindly ask you to unmute and pose your question to Mark. Jade. Sorry, my headset, my headset stopped working then. Don't worry, we're all set by technology. <laughs> if I could ask you to go on screen as well, if that, if you're oh. comfortable to do so, because it just makes it a little bit more real. Uh, and Mark, Mark, Mark is there for you. Hiya. So Hi. it was, it was just a case of understanding like the implementation side of it and, and where we would find actually more information on the scopes one to three under the GHGGP. Um, there's been something posted in the chat around the greenhouse gases protocol in terms of scopes one and scope three. Um, in simple terms, I, and I like to keep things really simple because I think businesses otherwise won't necessarily understand it. Um, getting it, getting your measurements. Basically, scope one is the is the gases that you produce directly as a business. So boilers, the vehicles that you're in control of. Um, anything that you directly emit through basically vehicles and um, heat and power. And then, and as the scopes develop, they get more complicated. So that's quite an easy one. Scope two is your indirect emissions. So that's the electricity that you buy, that you might heat your buildings, you cool your buildings. Um, anything that you bring into the organization in terms of um, materials that go into your basically, what, I don't know what your, your business does, but if you're making products, the, um, the cost of that effectively in terms of 
um, energy and power. And then scope three is, is effectively everything else that you are not in control of, which is an extremely challenging piece. And there's no fixed, there's no fixed guidance on that. Some businesses spend literally millions of pounds on trying to measure that. Other businesses just try and get the basics done. And what we've said to SMEs is you break it down into stages over a period of years, depending on how good your procurement is and your supply chain, start with that first thing you do is effectively communicate with your supply chain and start asking them some key questions and we issue questionnaires on that say all right guys first and foremost do you know what it is do you know what esg is do you measure your carbon emissions and then you start talking about the basics and then what is also credible and this is where the s and the g interlink with the e is if you have a credible supply chain that is effectively sustainable or ESG compliant, you've just ticked a huge amount of your boxes for your own environmental social governance plan, which makes you more credible when you go and do your pitches. Nine times out of 10 now, um, the pitches that the firm makes to listed entities, non-listed or large scale and mid cap companies um, do a hell of a lot of work in the SME, a huge amount of work in the SME sector in the UK. There is always a section on what we do as a business and our position is ITCC, Innovation, Trust, Talent and Climate. That's our approach as a firm internally. So we've taken the ESG and created our own approach. Um, they ask about what we do, i.e. are we credible to talk about it? And it was the same when I was at Hadlow. We always had to, um, towards, we always had to demonstrate that we were doing the same thing, that we were doing something. So it's okay to do it on a journey, JD. We're not perfect at the firm. We're on our journey to 2030. We're not net zero now, I wish. Um, we're currently doing an evaluation of our entire estate. We have, um, God, I can't remember, I think 23 offices in the UK. We're currently evaluating all of our buildings to see whether or not we're moving on certain buildings. Um, so there is a real journey there. Um, so that would be my advice. But start with the basics, JD, scope one. Excellent questions. Excellent questions, Mark. Very, very well answered. I find this stuff so fascinating, really insightful. I've really enjoyed today. Can I ask from our guests, are there any other questions that you would like to pose to either David or Mark today? No, don't worry. These guys are contactable on LinkedIn. Yes. Um, my colleague, Adam, will be combining the slides. So if you would like slides, and there have been several requests within the chat for a copy of the slide and also for a copy of the video. Um, uh, and my colleague, Adam, post event, will be getting those out to you. Gentlemen, as I say, really fascinating stuff, insightful, interesting, and lots of messages there that we can take forward and work Definitely. on yeah in, in in wrapping up have you had a, a an enjoyable time with us today has every single event i do with the uh kicc is enjoyable it's what i live uh, for with joe it's what i live for excellent you are such a charmer <laughs> david um, yeah. also Hi. many thanks to you ladies Brilliant. and gentlemen these events would not work without you supporting us you've been also interesting we've loved having the questions Big shout out to Mr. Martin White, who is a huge supporter of our work on this agenda. So thank you, as always, Martin. Thank you to all of our guests, in particular, our keynote speakers from McIntyre Hudson, not forgetting the magic fingers of Mr. Adam Taylor, who is there yes, in the brilliant. background, who gets very little credit, but without him oh. doing everything he does with the slides, these these events would not be as seamless and as smooth as they are. Can I just Without... say that, Kaz, that the, the event was seamless, by the way. Thank you very much for the techn technology. That's one of the best technology events we've, we've done, seamless. Mark, you're so kind. Ladies and gentlemen, as I say, thank you so much for joining us. We wish you a good forward day. I've been Kaz Macklin for Kent Invicta Chamber of Commerce. Thank you, guys.